You know, something that Carmen said just uh, stuck out to me really quickly was uh, we need a right revival in our land. How many believe that? And guess what? It starts with us, right? It starts with his church. So uh, if you're a first-time visitor, we're so glad you're with us. I know without a doubt God has something special for every one of us. But I don't know if you're like me, but uh, I love the Olympics. Anybody like the Olympics? And I guess they're back this summer in uh, Paris. They're probably going to be amazing. But one of my favorite stories of the Olympics actually comes... All the, goes all the way back to the 1992 Barcelona Games. There was this British runner by the name of Derek Redman, who four years earlier in the 1988 Olympic Games, he tore his Achilles tendon one hour before the race began. He tore his Achilles tendon in warm-ups. But before 1992 in the Summer Olympic Games, he had undergone eight surgeries to correct that injury. He worked really hard, went through all sorts of therapies, he healed up, and he finally got his second chance. Four years later, in 1992, he posted the fastest time of a first round. He went on to win his quarterfinal. Then in the semifinal, he's in the 400-meter race. He's running for Great Britain. He's worked so hard for this moment. So much of his life has been dedicated for this moment, and he now could compete and represent his country. But halfway through this race... He tore his hamstring. He tore his hamstring. Now, everybody would have uh, probably understood if Derek would have just walked off the track that day or limped off the track that day. I mean, it would have made sense. I mean, they could have said, you tried, you've got injured, you can bow out, but he couldn't and he wouldn't. He had worked so hard for that moment. He had fought for so long. And there was a grimace upon his face. But he was determined, I'm going to finish this race. I'm going to finish. I can imagine the track officials that were on the sidelines probably telling him, it's over, Derek. You need to move off the track. Maybe even his coach and his teammates were yelling, you're injured. It's time to give it up. It's time to quit. But something in him made him want to finish that race even more. Then there was a figure that emerged from alongside the track. It was Redmond's dad, Jim. He runs out on the track, waving off the officials that were trying to get Derek off the track. And when Derek saw his father, he asked him, he said, Dad, help me get back in my lane. So the father gave him his shoulder to lean on. Take a look at that picture. Kind of a touching picture. Those two walked the final meters of the race together. And 65,000 spectators rose to their feet to give Derek a standing ovation. Because something in him that day said, don't quit. You might be injured, but don't quit. You might be injured, you might be beat up, and you might be forgotten, but just finish the race you started. How many of you have ever been in a moment something like that? Where everybody could have given you an excuse to give up and quit, but you didn't. You were determined to keep going. Maybe they even told you, hey, it's time to give it up. You have no chance. But there was something in you that just knew that their advice, even though it might be the easy way out, you couldn't take their advice because you had to, had to, had to keep going. You know, advice can be a wonderful thing, but it can also be an absolute disaster. And if given a few moments, probably every one of us could think of a time that we had been given bad advice. We could also probably think of a few times we've given bad advice, amen? Amen. But in our text today, Paul has given advice on several different occasions by people who had consi a considerable influence in his life. These were special people in Paul's life. These were people that cared deeply for Paul, wanted the best for Paul, but the advice they gave him was totally not the advice that Paul knew he needed. They were giving the advice, but Paul knew it wasn't what he needed to hear. If you were here last week, we left off with the Apostle Paul. He's on his way back to Jerusalem. That's where the home base of the church started. That's also where James, the half-brother of Jesus, is one of the main leaders in the church in Jerusalem. And I mentioned last week, Jerusalem was going, the church in Jerusalem was going through a terrible persecution. And at the same time, on top of all that, they had a terrible famine. So Paul has taken up an offering from the many Gentile churches that he had started. And he's on his way to take it to Jerusalem to give it to the Jerusalem church. So if you have your Bibles today, and we're still in our Acts series, uh, turn to Acts chapter 21, verse 1, if you have your Bibles. If you don't, we'll have it up on the screen. 
But it says, after we had torn ourselves away from them. Let me stop here. What are they tearing themselves away from? Well, if you were here last week, you remember where Paul had a special meeting with the church leaders in Ephesus. And he told them, this is going to be the last time we're going to see each other face to face. This had to be extremely hard for Paul. Because Paul, Paul had poured his life and his love into these leaders from Ephesus for the past three years. And not only did he love them deeply, they loved him deeply. And they begged him. They begged him, don't go to Jerusalem. It says, after we had, after we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patera. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed in Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Let me stop here because I think it's so amazing just how accurate the Bible is. And remember, Luke is writing uh, the book of Acts. He's recording everything, not just here and there. He's recording everything. He's making detailed notes about where we went, where we stopped. He writes about 32 different countries. He writes about 54 cities, nine islands in every port, and he names every single one of them. He lists over 90-plus people, their titles, their positions, uh, Roman government officials, uh, spiritual leaders. So I would say without a doubt he's beyond thorough, right? He's beyond thorough. This isn't just a broad sweep of what happened. He is extremely detailed and really, it's all without error. I said all that to say, when we read these scriptures, people, this is history. It actually happened. This is history, but on the bigger scope, this is his story. Not just history, but it's his story. It's God's story. This word is God's story. That's why we have to pay so close attention. That's why we have to get to know it for ourselves. So once Paul lands in Tyre, he's, he realizes that it's going to take about a week to unload the ship, the ship's cargo, and then restock the ship. And once again, Paul's a man on the go. He doesn't sit in one place very long. He doesn't waste any time. So he seeks after the disciples that he knows are there. And these are probably disciples who actually fled to Tyre after Stephen was martyred, after Stephen was murdered. Luke tells us once Paul found these disciples, he stays with them for seven days. What do you think these disciples are telling Paul or trying to tell Paul? It says, through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. I'm sure they were like, hey, Paul, we know where you're headed. But we've heard from the Spirit that there's danger there. There's hardship there. So, Paul, don't go. We know, Paul, where your head and your heart is. But the Spirit says danger. So, Paul, please don't go. They're pleading with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. These disciples in Tyre are filled with the Holy Spirit. And they've actually received a word from God, a word of knowledge about the dangers that await Paul in Jerusalem. So they interpret this as meaning there's danger. if there's danger and hardship, then it's probably not from God. So, Paul, hey, you better not even go. But here's a point I want to make. Just because, we don't know God, just because we know God's plan, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy to follow God's plan. Amen? Just because you know God's plan does not mean it's going to be easy to follow God's plan. It's tough sometimes. Amen? Like in marriage. I know the Lord has put Cheryl and I together to do a work, and one time he said through a man of God to do a work in his name, so I have no doubts about that. Cheryl and I have been married for 31 years this year. And I say it's been all bliss, all the time. <laughs> of course, that bliss is short for blistering, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you know how it is on our wedding day? We stand there and we say, till death do us part. But then we go a little ways down the road in our marriage, and it's like, man, this marriage is tough. This marriage thing can be hard. Cheryl and I have been through a lot together, I can say that. We've been through times of plenty. We've seen times of lack, times where things are going great, and we've had other times when it seems like all hell is breaking loose. But I still know the Lord put us together. And if I'm honest, there have been a lot of times that we've gone through times, I'm sure just like you have, that haven't been so easy. They've been tough. We've all been there. 
I know some who have said, you know, I feel called to be a missionary overseas. That's noble. That's exciting. That's exciting and powerful. Until you get over there and you experience things like loneliness where you're so far away from your family. And you experience uh, spiritual persecution or maybe even spiritual warfare. And it's not so easy. It's hard. What I'm saying is there are many times in every one of our lives when following God's plan is not easy. When following God's plan is going to be hard. And that's what we see in the Apostle Paul's life. God's plan for the Apostle Paul was hard. I would say it was probably harder than most of our plans that God has for us. But look at, look at verse 5. When it was time to leave, we left. Paul's like, hey, see you later, alligator. I'm going to get on board this ship. He's ready to go. It says, when it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us, accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. I just have to stop for a second and picture that in my mind. That wives and children, the whole group, sent them off in prayer. What a good way to send them off. But Paul is determined to leave. He's got that one thought on his mind. He doesn't know what's going to happen next in his life, but we do know that the Holy Spirit... Uh, tells him in Acts chapter 20, verse 23, that in every city, prison and hardships are facing him. So the Holy Spirit doesn't give Paul the entire plan, but did allow him to understand what he was going to face. So think about the Apostle Paul. Paul moves forward in his faith, knowing that God was calling him to something that might be scary, something dangerous, and actually something that could be deadly. But Paul was still willing to go. That's faith, amen? He was still willing to go. Look at verse 6. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed in Telemus, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven, he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Uh, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. What are the odds of that? I mean, four unmarried daughters in his household that have the gift of prophecy in the same house. Pretty amazing. And you probably heard the old saying, prophets of a feather flock together. You ever heard that one? Maybe not. But it's true. Watch this in verse 10. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. I would say from reading just that little bit, this guy's kind of dramatic, amen? He's dramatic. He takes Paul's belt. He stands there. Everybody's watching him holding Paul's belt. And he says this, whoever owns this belt, well, everybody knows it's Paul's belt. Hello, they know it. Then he sits down in a chair and he hog ties himself and then says, this person who owns this belt is going to be bound in Jerusalem. Sounds a little bit dramatic. Sounds a little crazy. But really, I think he's sort of playing out the style of some of the Old Testament prophets. If you know the Old Testament at all, it's like Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 27, Jeremiah the prophet put a wooden yoke on his neck and then broke pots to get everybody's attention. Not exactly a normal thing to do. Ezekiel the prophet, he took a clay tablet, he drew a picture of Jerusalem on it, and then he broke it. And Ezekiel is also the guy that God called him to lay on his left side for 390 days. He laid on his left side continually for 390 days symbolizing the years of the sins of Israel. And he laid on his right side for 40 days, representing the sins of Judah. Uh, not exactly a normal thing to do there either. And what about Isaiah? What about him? You talk about being dramatic. Isaiah walked barefoot and naked for three years because God told him to. You know, uh, I'd be hard convinced uh, to tell you guys that God told me to do the same thing. Don't even think it because it's not going to happen. But my point is there were some really dramatic things, crazy things that these prophets were doing. And I said all that to say Agapus was in that vein. He was in that style. And for the record, there's no evidence that Agabus interpreted this prophecy. There's no evidence that he gave uh, Paul 
any indication whether to go to Jerusalem or not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul's friends sure tried to do that. They sure tried to tell him what to do. Do you know that sometimes our worst advice can come from other Christians? Actually from people who love us. And you know why? It's because they're trying to talk us out of suffering. They're trying to talk us out of suffering. They don't want us to suffer because they love us. Well, Paul's friends were the same way. Paul's best friends didn't want him to go because they didn't want to see Paul suffer. That's understandable. But at the end of the day, Paul's mission wasn't to please his friends. It was to please God. Amen. And to fulfill his calling, no matter what he had to face. Look at verse 12. Luke writes this. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. When you see Luke use that word we, it means that Luke is joined in now trying to convince Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. But look at Paul's response. You talk about a man of faith. Look at verse 13. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he could not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. They couldn't do anything about Paul's determination. In my opinion, Paul wasn't rejecting divine prophecy. He wasn't. He was rejecting a wrong interpretation of what they thought God was saying. And these believers that believed that when Paul got to Jerusalem, he was going to be bound, thrown in prison, they were right. But they were wrong in their conclusion that Paul shouldn't go. The warning from the Holy Spirit was really intended to prepare Paul for what was about to happen. Not to stop him, but to prepare him. And their request for Paul not to go was understandable. We'd probably all done the same thing. But it wasn't from God. They had good intentions, but it wasn't from God. How many know that we can have good intentions, the best intentions, but sometimes they're not the intentions of God? So when I read this passage, it forces me, and it should force you, to ask yourself the question, if I knew following Jesus would lead to more pain and suffering, would I still follow him? Think about it. You know, it's easy to follow him or say we follow him when everything is going great. When not, not so much. But I want to talk about three things that I see that apply to us from this scripture. The first one is a question I want you to ask yourself. Number one, do you pursue comfort and success more than you do obedience with God? Do you pursue comfort and success more than you do obedience to God? You know, when I think of Paul's life, he didn't live his life that way. He didn't live his life that way. He was much more concerned with the kingdom of God than he was about his own physical safety. He was more than his own uh, personal achievement. Paul didn't measure the will of God by his comfort, not at all. He measured it by his spiritual calling. And Paul knew without a shadow of a doubt that God had called him to go to Jerusalem and take this monetary gift that had been collected by the Gentile churches. And no matter what his friends said, or how they tried to talk him out of it. He knew he was responsible to God for his choice. He was responsible to God for his choice, and he was ready to go. He had already made that choice. You know, I think the problem in our world today is we get way over, our pre, we get preoccupied with making money, paying the bills, succeeding at work, accumulating more and more stuff. But at some point, we have to stop and admit, hey, I could be pursuing all that a whole lot more than I'm pursuing God. Amen? Sometimes we have to stop and ask ourselves, how are we balancing things out? And I do think we live in a world that is pushing us in the wrong direction every day. Spiritual obedience is laying our desires at Jesus' feet, laying our wants, our desires at His feet, and allowing Him to shape us, to mold us, to shape our hearts, to reflect His heart, to reflect His desires. In his book called Radical, David Platt, he talked about how true believers will think back on their lives in their last days. And he says, we will not wish we had made more money, acquired more stuff, lived more comfortably, taken more va vacations, watched more television, pursued greater retirement, or been more successful in the eyes of the world. Instead, knowing they will soon stand before the Lord, they will wish they had given themselves more of themselves to living this short life here on earth for our Savior. I think that's so true for all of us. You may not see it that way right now, but it's the truth. 
So let me ask again, what if accomplishing God's will in your life means more discomfort, means more sacrifice and risk? Would you still follow him? Would we still follow him? I think we ought to ask ourselves that question every day. The second point is, we need to find God's will for our life. We need to, God has a will for every one of our lives. We need to find out what that will is for our life because we live in a terribly busy world. Have you noticed? I mean, there's busyness everywhere. There's so much going on all the time. There's so many distractions from every direction. You know how it is when you go to, uh, I think, one of my favorite restaurants, Texas Roadhouse. Um, it's kind of uh, the loudest restaurant, too. It's packed with people talking louder and louder to talk over the loud music that's blaring. And the waiter staff screaming out somebody's birthday. Amen? But the older you get, I found out it's harder to even hear the person sitting across the table from you. You know why? Because there's too much commotion. There's just too much going on. Well, people, we live in a world where there are so many voices coming at us from all different directions. Everything and everyone is competing for our attention. But not everything speaking is good. I guarantee you that. Because some of those voices have an agenda to kill, steal, and destroy. And the only one that's speaking perfectly is our God. He's the only one that is speaking perfectly and for our benefit. It's God. You know, I think about this and I think if God's voice is going to be turned up in our lives, then all the other voices have to be turned down. Amen? If His voice is going to be louder, we have to quiet the other voices. Did you know it's God's intention to speak to every one of us? He wants to have a personal conversation with you. But let me ask you today, are you sitting in this service expecting God to speak? Are you anticipating a word from the Lord today? Are you? Sometimes we come in here as a routine. We come in here and I do the same thing sometimes. We're not expecting God to speak like we should. But when we gather corporately together as the body of Christ, I believe the Holy Spirit is running through these aisles. I believe he wants to speak to us in a special way. So after hearing what I've said so far, you might be thinking, well, how do I make God's voice louder in my life? I'll give you a few ways. The number one way is right here. The Bible, God's Word. This is God's instruction manual to His people. Do you realize that? To be led by God's Word. I like what it says in Psalms 119.105. It says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So how do we know if we're doing God's will? We take these, this word and we let it lead us. We take this word, we let it guide us. Because it is the final authority on everything. And as we read it and we meditate on it and we read story after story of how he led other people, we can see how God wants to lead us. So if you don't know what God is calling you to do today, or if you don't know what it feels like to do God's will, start with Scripture. The best place you can start when God's Word tells you don't do something, you know it's not according to His will then, right? And I'd say that rules out about half of our decisions, makes it a whole lot easier. You know, when it comes to me, it's never God's will for me to flirt with another woman. It's not good for my health either. Uh, amen, Cheryl? <laughs> so I can rule that one out. It's not God's will for me to live in immor immorality. It's not God's will for me to live as a gossip. And let me just say, don't disguise your gossip as, oh, I'm so concerned. Because God knows the truth. God knows you like to gossip. But it's not God's will that I live in unforgiveness, hatred, or sin. That makes about the other half of my decisions a whole lot easier. But another way that we can know God's will is by discerning. Taking time to discern things through the Spirit. Discerning and listening to the people of God. That's a good way to do it. You have to be careful, but it's a good way. The Bible says, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You know, even when I'm unsure about something, I seek out godly counsel from trusted godly men and women. First place I go usually is to my wife because she has some major insight both into the Lord and into me. There's wisdom in that for sure. But you might be sitting here thinking, well, wait a minute, Paul didn't follow that pattern. Paul disregarded the counsel of all the multitude. I would say no. He didn't disregard it. He waited heavily. And he knew the calling that was in his heart outweighed all the things the other people were saying. 
He was secure in the calling in his heart, so much that he discerned what was right or wrong, whether it sounded good from the people or not. He knew what God's will was for his life. You know, when anyone gives you or tries to give you counsel, you ought to listen, but you ought to weigh it out. But I'll say this, don't let anyone make the decision for you because they could miss it. God speaks through people, but the Bible says to be careful and test the Spirit. I think King James says try the Spirit. It's because, hey, people, we're flesh. We're imperfect. We make mistakes. We miss it. So be careful who you go to for advice. And I'll say this, if God has been moving you to or towards a certain plan or a promise, He usually sends someone to confirm it along your path, to confirm what's already been dropped into your spirit. God, that's the way God works. But if you still aren't sure, listen to this. Write it down, tuck it away, and wait on the Lord. Write it down, tuck it away, and wait on the Lord because maybe it's not a right now word for you. Maybe it's more like the Apostle Paul situation where it's a get ready Paul word. It's a get ready word for what's ahead. And the third way to make God's voice louder in your life is prayer. I can't say enough about this one. Unfortunately, with a lot of us, prayer seems to be a last resort instead of a first response. Prayer is communication with God. It's talking with God. But the problem starts when we do all the talking. Amen? I mean, we pull out our list of wants and we give it to God and we walk away and don't even ever let God respond. How many have ever been talking to someone and you can't get a word in edgewise? Don't elbow your spouse right now. But you know, when it comes to prayer, I think we need to stop and push the pause button to realize, hey, God needs to speak here too. Amen? You probably won't hear him speak through a burning bush like Moses did, but I guarantee you, if you will yield your heart, mind, and spirit over to him, he will speak. Because our God wants to communicate. Our God wants to speak with us. That's why I love Psalms 46.10, where God says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still, be quiet, and know that I am God. Because people, it's in the stillness, not the busyness, that we hear the voice of God. God will bring things to your mind in those quiet times. He'll bring things to your heart. And really, the more scripture you know, the more faith-filled your prayers are going to be. And through prayer, His purposes are going to become your purposes. His priorities are going to become your priorities. He will always answer our prayer. He always does. He hears them. He answers them. Not always the way we want. But I guarantee, and I've said this many times, He will answer with a yes or a no or a wait. Amen? A yes, no, or a wait. So the more time you spend in prayer, the more sensitive you'll become to His promptings and to His voice. But hearing that small, still voice takes a little practice. You have to give God some quiet time. You have to give God some personal time. Look at Proverbs 8, 17. God says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. God's desire is to make his will known to us. I guarantee you, God is speaking, but are we listening? God is speaking, but are we listening? That's the hard part. The third thing that we can learn from this scripture is God will reveal our next move when the time is right. How many know God's timing is different than our timing? We think he's way late a lot of times. No, he's going to be right there at the right time. Paul didn't know exactly what was going to happen to him next when he went into Jerusalem. But Paul was just expected to take the next step. You know why? Because with God, it, the no, knowledge wasn't the goal. Obedience was the goal. God's not so concerned about how much you know is how obedient we are, as he is about how obedient we are. You know, there are many people, I'm sure like me, who like having closure. I mean, we like to plan. We don't want surprises. We like organization. And it makes me feel safe to know that. Kind of gives me a, maybe an illusion of having control. But what we need to realize is that kind of completeness isn't offered to us in this world. That kind of completeness only is going to come when we get to heaven. But in the meantime, what's offered to us is an invitation to a journey. God is inviting us to a journey to trust Him and to obey Him. It's an invitation to follow Jesus as He leads us down some pretty mysterious paths sometimes. My pastor Mike Van Britsen from Belleville, 
He used to say, real faith enjoys the journey. Real faith enjoys the journey. Good times or bad times, I can still enjoy the journey because I know my God is still in control. Psalms 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Notice God doesn't promise to give you a spotlight for your path or for your future. No, he promises to give you a lamp, a little lamp for your feet. That's how God works. A lamp only gives us enough light sometimes to just take the next step. God will often only lead us one step at a time. But you know what that's called? Walking by faith. Walking by faith. That's what God expects from you and me. And just remember, if God hasn't revealed it to you yet, maybe you don't need to know it. Amen? Maybe you don't need to worry about it. A great man, Oswald Chambers, once said, Faith never knows where it's being led, but it loves and knows the one who's leading. I love that. Faith never knows where it's being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. You know, you'll never have faith in a God that you don't know. So my question to every one of us, including myself, do you really know him today? Are you getting to know him better today? It's the most important question you could ever ask yourself because it determines everything. Because if you know him, if you love him, if he's brought change into your life, then you can trust him. And even when your life seems like it flips upside down, he's still a good, good God. He is still faithful and you can trust him. And if you know him today, He'll give you power. He'll give you the power you need for whatever comes down that path. You might be taking just one step at a time and something else is running for full force at you. He'll give you the power to handle whatever's in your path. You can hear his voice. You can trust his voice. And when you can trust his voice, you can obey his voice. Because people, I guarantee you, our God loves you so much that he only wants the best for our lives. Amen. Right now, I want you to sit quietly for just a second. Spend a second in his presence with me. And I want you to think in your heart, God, what's a hard thing that you're calling me to do? Maybe I haven't been listening, but I need to pay more attention. What's a hard thing you're calling me to do? Be bold and say, God, what's a scary thing you're calling me to do? Maybe he's calling you to step out of your comfort zone. But the greatest thing you could ask him is, God, what do you want to say? What are you speaking to my heart today? People, I believe all the time, 24-7, God is speaking. But the question I have to ask myself, and you need to ask yourself, are we listening? Are we setting aside time for God to truly lead, guide, and direct us through reading His Word, through prayer, through focusing on Him and shutting out the distractions? Could you stand your feet? If you need prayer for anything, I invite you to come up after service. If you, for anything. may not have anything to do with my service at all or message today. That's fine. Just come up for prayer if you need prayer. And if you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus and to invite him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, we want to lead you through a simple prayer that you can walk out of here knowing that your name has been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, that your eternity is settled with him forever in heaven. But could you bow your hearts in prayer? Father, we surrender our lives over to you. We relinquish the rights of our lives. Give them all over to you, Lord God, today. And I ask that you would do what only you can do. Father, we trust you. We want to trust you, no matter what. Lord, help us to hear your voice. Help us to block out, shut out the noises of this world. Help us to shut out the busyness of our day. And help us just to take time to sit in the stillness of your presence. Father, I thank you for being a God who wants to speak to us. And Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, if they're having a hard time trusting you, Lord, I pray today that that all changes. Father, help us to walk in obedience to you in the big things and in the little things. Lord God, nobody knows our heart like you do. And Father, we ask you to show us anything in our heart that's displeasing to you, anything in our life that's displeasing to you, and we ask you to forgive us of that because we want to be a people that follows you, a people that pursue you, and a people that please you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. See you next week.